Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the order. The uh... June meeting of the Sigma Board of Directors. Our attendance. Um, well, I'd like to start off by uh, announcing that uh, Board of Director Member uh, Mary Navas has resigned. And, uh, very thankful for all of her contributions to data uh, the last few years. We we're sorry to see her go. She was a big boy. But, uh, that is for today. Um, Lord Pearson, Therese, are you there? Are you uh, in tenants? Here. Are you at the lobby? Yep, here. Uh, Dr. Portillo? Here. Michael Jones, here too. So we have four board members present. From the staff, we have Ms. Derrick and Ms. Ketley. Those of you who are not in attendance. In terms of uh, guests, we have I've already forgotten what Josh said. Your name is Edgar. Edgar. Last name? What? Camacho. Camacho. Edgar shared with us a very exciting uh, project that's going to be of great benefit to himself and his students. So thank you for doing that. Um, we have in the Guests online. No Zoom guests. Already. That takes care of introductions. Oh, public comment. Um, um, okay, well, let's um, have approval of the agenda first. Is there anything, any changes to the agenda that anybody would want to make? Hearing none, we'll go on. Uh, according to the agenda you have to hear, you have us going into closed session no, before right. the public comments. We follow that? We should follow that. That's correct. Thank okay. You. So we will uh, follow the agenda here and um, go into closed session. So oh, we will see you when we come back. A motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Oh, I ran over. Okay, so a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I'm probably doing a roll call vote since uh, everybody is present. Mm -hmm. Motion passed and it's approved. So now go to closed session. Okay, the board of directors has returned from closed session, and there is no report coming out of closed session tonight. Move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the public comments. Edgar, would you like to make a public comment? Okay, so um, the purpose of this meeting is to have a hearing about our 24-25 LCAP, um, and then um, we'll take feedback from people here tonight, as well as the staff. We've gotten feedback from our school site council about it, um, and then this will all go into our final LCAP that we'll approve in a couple weeks on Tuesday, June 18th. So um, just to begin again, um, 
with where we're at with the LCAP. The LCAP has, same as LCAP has four broad goals. The broad goals are all students are academically successful. All students are prepared for college. Uh, parents and guardians are engaged as partners through education, communication, and collaboration to ensure students are college or career ready. And finally, all students will learn in a safe, welcoming, and inclusive learning environment where students are engaged in their own learning and the school community. So within those broad goals, we have a number of metrics to measure our success. And I'm going to go through each of those this, uh, this evening, as well as actions that we're going to take to improve on those goals for 24-25. Um, <clears throat> so starting off with goal one, all students are academically successful. Um, one, some data points that I'll bring in the second meeting in June will be our STAR performance. So we've got two weeks left to school and the students are taking the, their third administration of the STAR. And I'll show um, the board at the June 18th meeting growth on that STAR over the course of the school year, hopefully. Um, and then I'll also show a report on Pages Read and Accelerated Reader, which is grade six to eight to see how our students are doing and progressing on uh, their independent reading in middle school. So reader, reader is a program where students can read a novel and it's got thousands of novels and at the end they can take a quiz to show their proficiency on the novel they just read. Um, and then August and September, we should um, have CAST results back from this administration in the spring, as well as the CAST results, as well as the LPAC results, which will lead to the reclassification rate when we take a look at students' grades. Our AP passage rate, we just wrapped up uh, four AP exams in the last couple weeks here. And then um, we'll also talk about student grades and eligibility having over a 2.0 GPA. And so those reports will come out in August once we get the reports back from the state. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about how we can make our students academically successful, um, we're taking some steps this coming year to um, hopefully improve on that goal. The first is AVID. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. And we are sending seven teachers and two admin to the Sacramento Avid Summer Institute. Um, and that's at the end of June, the fourth week of June. <clears throat> and then we're sending six teachers and two admin to the Anaheim Avid Summer Institute. And that's the fourth week of July. Is there any crossover with the teachers? Like different teachers going to? Uh, different teachers and different admin going to each of them. And so the reason we're having, they, I gave each the teachers a choice to go to one or the other. Um, and so 13 ended up signing up. We have about 29 full-time teachers, so about half, um, a little less than half signed up to go to these summer institutes. Um, and then the admin will be there. And basically, I think the way it was described to me by AVID is they'll be in seminars in the morning, and then in the afternoon, they're going to, we'll meet as a team and develop goals and actions we can take to implementing AVID in our school the following school year. Um, then we have a uh, updated middle school designated ELD. Um, so we have designated ELD after school, after lunch for 30 minutes daily. And um, it's not worked as well as we wanted it to. There's a curriculum called Amplified that the ELA teachers use in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade middle school. And there's a corresponding ELD curriculum that supports that. Both of them are Amplified. But the teachers have expressed frustration about uh, the lessons, the way it's set up and designed where it's not quite meeting the students' needs. And so we're going to brainstorm how we can set up a system where we're, one, making sure we're meeting the students where they're at in terms of their reading and writing ability. Two, measuring them on the ELD standards. Three, having some type of regular check-in on whether they're improving on those standards. And then four, making it super clear and easy to follow in terms of what should be expected from both the teachers and the students um, to earn the stipend. Teachers get a stipend for teaching designated DLD. Um, and for the students, how well they are progressing or not progressing, depending on how engaged they are. So we've been kind of talking about this all spring, and we're trying to nail down the specifics um, as we close out the school year here. Um, in high school, we split the students who are ELs into um, classes like one out of the three classes has the ELs in grades 9, 10, and 11, but there wasn't the level of explicit designated ELD instruction that we wanted to see from our high school. And so this coming year, we're going to have one teacher who will lead designated ELD for our high school students, 
and study skills class for grades 19 and 11. There's going to be a tie-in between AVID and ELD. And what I like about this plan is it's one person, and I can trust that this person will follow through with what the expectations are for designated ELD. And then um, the final way that I hope CIVIC can improve our students' academic success is we're hiring interventionists. Um, currently, we have five interventionists, but we're still hiring subs, so one or two of those might be turned into a sub or possibly a one-to-one -one student support. We have one student who is a moderate uh, moderate to severe IEP student, and so we might have to reposition that person to be one of one for her, for him. Um, but the five new interventions are going to be interventionists are going to work with the students who are um, ELs or students with disabilities, and then kind of collaborate with the teachers on whether we're going to do academic push-ins where they're in the classroom supporting the students, or pull out and small group work. We have a lot of little nooks and crannies where we can make that happen. Um, and we're going to use CASP, STAR, and GPA data to inform who's going to be in those small groups in grades 6 through 10. And then, um, yeah, like I said, combination of pushing and pull-out support. Um, so two of the five interventionists are credential teachers. The other three are going to, we're going to have to teach them exactly what we want to see um, from them in this position. Instructional aids, exactly. Uh, do we, yeah, any questions or comments about goal one? The question I had is, is there, but what I hear is that you are saying that uh, CLD is uh, basically a responsibility that's addressed by the ELA staff. Is there any expectation that teachers in other subject areas have for ELD? Yeah, so yes. So teachers in other subject areas are expected to implement what's called integrated English language development. And so there's a number of uh, EL supports from sentence stems and frames to glossaries to structured student talks to um, specific groupings to help the students succeed who are ELs to eventually reclassifying as fluent English proficient. And so the integrated ELD is what's expected from other subject areas. And then I do want to clarify, this year in high school, the e high school ELA teachers were expected to do designated ELD. In middle school, though, it was anybody who signed up to receive the stipend. So we have a science teacher, a math teacher, and then two English teachers who are completing ELD in middle school. And uh, is your... Uh evaluation of uh, students and their progress in ELD, do you keep track of students who are reclassified? We do, and we had a dip in our reclassification rate last year. I'm hoping it was an anomaly, but if it wasn't, um, we'll see in July when we get our CAF scores back and our LPAC scores back, whether that was. I'm hoping that this will counteract that dip in our reclassification rate. Average this year? Oh, great question. So every teacher that signed up, the 13, are going to subject-specific classes, and then they're going to get their math AVID or English AVID. And so we're going to go school-wide with that across the subject areas. And then we're also going to have um, an AVID tutorial that's going to be at the high school level in grade 11, taught by a teacher who has lots of experience with AVID, and she also went to the summer suit last year. Um, and so... One of my concerns is, you know, we're on goal one, but as we go through this, there's lots and lots of initiatives, and AVID's a big undertaking, and so I want to make sure we have the bandwidth and time to really dedicate fully to making this come alive in our school. One thing I will say that, I mean, AVID has a lot of different ways you can go, but if I was to nail, like, kind of summarize where I really want to see movement is when you look at the types of work that students are expected to do. A lot of times it's web step of knowledge one, kind of recall who, what, when, where, how, why, maybe DLK two, but I want to push the types of assignments to DLK three and four. And one of the things that we've been talking a lot about in this implementation is, I don't think the teachers are like, I don't want to do that. I think they all would love to do that. But part of the issue is, especially if you have students who are below grade level and or ELs, their vocabulary and reading ability is not to the level yet. 
where they need to be to be entering into those DLK threes and fours. And so how we bridge that gap with students who might be below grade level in their reading while also maintaining a really high expectation in terms of what we expect from the students is kind of what I hope to see out of AVID, one of the things. The other thing I would say that I really want to see out of AVID is executive functioning skills. So a lot of times students, I'm generalizing, but like they come in and they're like, okay, do your work. But then what that really means is I will wait until somebody like guides me step by step by step. And, you know, I'm glad that they comply with that. But we, what we want to do is like try and transform it. So like the students take more initiative for themselves so that they kind of take a little bit more ownership of their own education and try to, you know, think beyond just what's my teacher quote making me do today. So have, have you thought about an avid coordinator? Uh, I haven't, but that is a great suggestion. Avid's, <laughs> I really believe in avid. I've been at several schools and initiated okay. avid, and the programs have had positive impacts everywhere I've seen anything. So okay. I'm all for having avid, but it's a lot, and it's it's a lot to ask you to coordinate. Yeah. So it just Every school I know of that has an AVID program has at least one teacher who is the AVID coordinator. He's the go-to AVID source. And, and is the AVID coordinator typically a teacher? Yeah. Okay. In fact, it works better if it's a teacher. I would think so. Um, and it can be done with a stipend. It can be done with a release period, but that's a lot more money. Okay. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, we were running in that too because a lot of schools have hired community school grant coordinators and we did not hire that um, so we're kind of doing that in-house and so far it's working but we'll see um, but no I, I think yeah I'll look at our staffing setup but I think that is a great suggestion so well, when these 13 teachers come back from workshops some of them are going to be really motivated and some won't be so yeah. Who's the most motivated? Put him in chat. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. Yeah. Other comments or questions? If you're feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Great transition. So goal two: all students are prepared for college. So data points to measure goal two success. So we have two weeks left to go in school, and then I'll be able to tell you what our graduation rate was, our dropout rate was, our percentage of students who are gonna meet the UC college entrance requirements, number of students who are graduating with the seal by literacy, number of students graduating with full seat seal merit, percentage of students entering two year versus four year. And then um, August, September, I was able to download a form of all of our graduates from 2015 onward and whether they've graduated from any post-secondary institution, be it Cabrillo or four-year or trade school. And so I've just been kind of looking at that, but I'm going to put that into a presentation and uh, go over how we've performed as a school since 2015, our first graduating class to now. Um, and then um, how will we improve on preparing our students for college for the upcoming school year? Um, first one is we're going to implement what's called the California college guidance initiative to be super clear we hope to do that this year our director of technology former director of technology um, moved away at the end of the school year and he would have been the person to kind of help sync our school information system synergy with uh, CCGI and so we have a new tech coordinator who has done that and he just finished it last week so we know we'll have CCGI for the upcoming school year CCGI is a uh, being rolled out at all uh, high schools in California. And basically it's an online platform that's gonna allow you to review your high school graduation progress. So see your transcript in there, see where you're at, apply to colleges through the platform, complete a FAFSA for, through the platform or the California Dream Act, um, explore careers, take career inventory surveys, um, and also send transcripts to universities. So it's kind of like an all-in-one top shop. Um, and we're hoping to get that off the ground uh, fully in the 24-25 school year. Um, 
Number two, to prepare kids for college, uh, we're going to offer five AP classes this year, this upcoming school year. We had so this we had a record this year was four, and now we'll have five. So uh, AP U.S. History, Literature and Composition, 2D Art, Psychology, and Spanish. Um, and we had a great turnout at our um, AP meeting last week. We had two meetings going on, one in English, one in Spanish in the auditorium and then in room 109 where we went over what the expectations are for the courses, summer assignments, and uh, how the course works in terms of college credit, GPA boost, and uh, whether, um, oh, in the end of year exam, that's not just like your teacher's exam, but like the nationwide assessment that the students take. Um, and it was great too, because all the teachers came to the meeting. So it was great to see them out and they could talk about their own courses. So that's something else that we're doing up in this upcoming school year. Um, the third thing we're doing is uh, we're offering an IT essentials class on campus. This past year, we offered IT essentials to our seniors. About eight students took it. It didn't go that well um, for a number of reasons. One, there was a kind of a revolving door of substitutes between November and February. Um, which I think was a turnoff for the students who participated. Um, they also had to walk over to Diamond Tech, which is across town after school for the most part, um, which also was a turnoff, especially when there was a sub or whatnot at that class. Um, so we're going to offer the class on site. It's going to be through the County Office of Education. It'll be here. So we're going to get uh, students signed up for that. In fact, they already have signed up on a form to express their interest in the course. We're also going to offer an honors English class in grade 12 and then promote dual enrollment at Cabrillo College. So those are our plans for 24-25. Comments or questions? I'd just make a comment. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, Sentinel uh, article about two of my Alianza Stoli scholars who are twins who were enrolled at um, uh, Wasco High School and also at Cabrillo, and both earned associate degrees. Before they finished high school. Wow. Simultaneously. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, so I feel like, I mean, we always had dual enrollment, but I feel like we haven't pushed or emphasized that enough in terms of this being like a real path where you can kind of get ahead in terms of your education. Edgar, I'd love to hear from you. So actually, in addition to that, I know a friend that's about to complete their associates mm. uh, next year. That could be so we'll see more classes. Which is really uh -huh. um, but I also like to ask if, because I know, for example, like Watson, Ohio, and there they can get, they can get college credit, right? But they can also count the classes as high school credit. I think that more makes a lot more sense to mm -hmm. attend those classes. Yeah. And it also opens more time for them to take more classes in each building. Interesting. So you bring up a good point. We've always had a policy where the classes that they take won't, it'll go on like an other section of their transcript, but it doesn't count towards their high school graduation grant requirements, nor does it count towards their GPA. Sometimes that's came up in terms of like who's going to be valedictorian or salutatorian and um, that type of thing. But it sounds like what you're suggesting is Seba should revisit that policy and maybe offer these classes as credit bearing courses for our high school. And so if you took, you know, say uh, some type of science class that could be in place of a science class at Seba. Yeah, because I think uh, at least personally, uh -huh. I took some um, math courses at Cabrillo and I was so pleased enough to this semester, it is all right because the professor should buy it. It is allowing me to go to campus for it. But in the first semester, I have to do algebra work, which I didn't really need to do. Yeah. Okay. And the last thing we should be doing is putting a hurdle up in front of kids that are trying to do that. No, you're right. I think uh, just for transparency, um, what we don't want to incentivize is that everybody tries to get around our high school requirements by saying, oh, I don't want to take any of the classes here. I want to go take them at Cabrillo. But um, I think there's a lot of uh, incentives for the suggestion you're providing. Um, maybe we should revisit that policy. Why would that be a problem? 
Well, because let's say, and I'm just going to give an example. I'm asking this is a true example. Let's say that there was a teacher who was known as being extra strict or difficult. And now of our 55 person junior class or senior class, they say, oh, you know what? They offer English 401 at Cabrillo. Let's go take that over there. And now 45 kids are not going to save up for this course. They're all going over to complete that requirement at Cabrillo. Oh, so I'm just saying, like, the kids pass the teachers and the school. <laughs> and that, I think, maybe, maybe not exactly like that, but that would be, if we went with this, which I, I am open to exploring, that would be one of the issues we would encounter, almost undoubtedly. Could we embrace it as a great opportunity to head in a new direction rather than saying, no, you can't do that because that grouchy old algebra teacher needs students so he can be employed. Uh -huh. it, it's yeah. never been an issue in any of the schools that I've been associated with. Okay. They let kids get credit for the community college. There's never been a run on the courses that has caused a losing a course at the high school. What happens in San Diego? We I've been part of committees over the years where that exact same argument's been brought up. It's it's not it's not student centered. It's all about FTEs yeah. and union contracts. Uh, and we haven't even got that far right. in terms of that. But um, and then I think the other equity argument, as I'm just kind of putting everything out there, is and maybe we can even make a policy about this. But like let's say that you don't have the ability to go to Cabrillo for whatever reason. You are have to be here at Seba. And now you're at a disadvantage because when we're calculating GPAs, if they all get their grade bumps from attending a Cabrillo course, now, even though I've, I never had the same opportunity to go to Cabrillo. And so when we're calculating like, oh, you get a five because you got an A in that course instead of a four, that can be discriminatory or it could be viewed as that. So we talk, and I'm not saying I agree with that, but I remember that was a thing what, that we discussed Ever, Did that come up in your conversation? Um, not so much because we were talking about like the top oh. those students for like oh, yeah. they're gonna be fine. Okay. It's more just like the issue of yeah. the entire population. Yeah. Kind of to your point. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, no, there's there were sensitive conversations. And you can make an argument walking over to the plaza to go to Cabrillo Watsonville. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. But oftentimes there's courses that are only offered at Aptos. And so then you've got to have some type of car transportation over there. The other issue that opens up to, <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking about this, and again, I'm really want to explore it, is they're going to say, okay, I really want to take this course that starts at, I don't know, 115 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, on Tuesday or is an A day, let's say Tuesdays and Fridays. Tuesdays an A day, Friday's a B day. Well, now I need to have both Tuesday and Friday early release to take this course. Now I'm going to drop two courses to do that. I put it on the switch on Monday. I'm just saying, like, sometimes depending on when the courses are, if there's, like, an overlap there. So. And that did come up one year. I remember we were looking at that. I think eventually we settled down on the method. That's what it came down to, like, how many students are we actually speaking about. Uh-huh. Once we kind of thinned it all out combed it all out we we'll talked about a small handful yeah that's eventually right. that's what it came down to it was a small handful the parents were super demanding <laughs> and so for that small handful we made accommodation but you know, like a FD, 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 FD. yeah if the kids don't like it but that's not in charge of so. yeah. well and as the as you get rolling with this program and more kids are taking classes at watson world then other things can happen often they could end up teaching a class on your campus which is always really beneficial. We have three or four community college classes at East Colorado Academy. So that's great for the kids. Yeah. We, we, for a student that goes and attends Cabrillo, we still get their ADA, right? Um, as long as they're here for four hours, we get their ADA. Well, actually, they're here for five seconds. There you go. We get their ADA. They just have to be here. So the kids that but they need to be here for four hours. Otherwise, yeah. be sitting in the classroom. Oh, no, no, I, guess. <laughs> um, it, I would I, again. I, I I would hope that we would embrace it as a great opportunity. Yeah. worth exploring and mm -hmm. heading down. And 
if you know it, you know, a challenge came up, see if we can't find creative solutions to deal with it, rather than assuming it's going to be a headache. Yeah, great point. And one thing that um, you might want to start with, I don't know if you already have this, I think you don't, because I remember asking about this pretty early in high school. Um, where if the class is not being offered here, then yeah, they're definitely more than welcome to be able to do it. Being them, being freshman, sophomore, you know, junior, whatever high school kids they are. Um, because I, I ran into the person where he was like, this is just yeah. stuff I already know. Um, it was more like, well, you have to wait for next week. Mm. So versus the like, okay, well, you know, we don't have the class here. We don't have, um, or we cannot accommodate you, you know, to bump up all the way to where the juniors are because <clears throat> you're already a freshman. Um, but then you, you have the option of go to Cabrillo and take that algebra class or take that, you know, algebra two class or whatever that is. So that might be a way to start it. Like not so much open the door to like the same classes you have here in, the, in, in campus. You can go take it in Cabrillo, but at least start it where we don't have it here. But you can go to yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Um, <clears throat> another thing, there's just to be super clear on this, one of the things that we've struggled with is many of our students in high school will look at, am I required to have this class to graduate? And if I'm not, they'll be like, yeah, I'll take the F. And take what? The F. And just not do any work in the course. Um, <laughs> And I'd like to say this is four or five kids, but no, it's a lot of students. Um, and so that's another thing that we're working with um, in terms of, we tried to set up our master schedule so that the students felt like they had to pass all of these students to grad, all of these classes to graduate from high school so that they can't be in a class that they technically don't have to pass because then they're just like, no thanks, you're gonna get an F, that's fine, as long as I graduate. So there's no requirement that it says that you have one or two or three Fs that, that you're ineligible to graduate? So regardless of the class? You only have to meet the high school graduation requirements Could set out by saying a requirement being that you not have an excess of some number of that, yeah, that could be a challenge. So it's like basically it's trying to support the high end and also bring up the students who struggle a little bit more. And then the final thing, we can talk about this for a while, is since students are sometimes have struggled historically in math and in English to a lesser extent, we set up our classes so that there's a block class for both English and math every day rather than every other. So like, all right, if you have block, a block of 88 minutes of math and algebra daily, we feel like, okay, you'll have more success in succeeding in learning the math than if you only had it every other day, which is typically how a block schedule works. So. Rachel, what's your perspective on that question? Um, I mean, I always thought it was weird that we don't use the credits. And I think it would be nice and ideal to like have those extra classes, but we don't really like, own what they enroll in you know like and their enrollment times are a little bit different than our schedule and i think speaking to like what you're talking about is like some parents don't want their kids to go to Cabrillo; they want them to be here so it's like we have to have a class i mean i'm all for dual enrollment i did a lot of like college classes in high school but um those are just these challenges with like you know, making sure the students are getting here what they need, but also like in the students like Edgar being able to kind of like push themselves a little bit more and maybe get outside of Sayla and take some courses that we don't offer. But I think it's like it's such a hard balancing beam. And like, again, like we, we used to have a lot of students who failed a lot of Cabrillo classes, you know, and then it's like, do we also put that on our transcripts, <laughs> you know? Yeah, even just to, uh, as a side, like I have up here, Offer IT Essentials class, Nobody, everybody that was in the IT Essentials class this year, I don't think passed the class. Um, nope, you passed the class. Correct. Yeah. Because it doesn't. Oh. 
Edgar, what's your perspective? Do you know, or do you, well, do you, or do you know someone that will look at a class and say, that doesn't go, that doesn't count towards graduation, so I'm just going to warm the seat and I'm not going to do any work in that class? Okay, well, uh, I want to say I will definitely take that up and I think we can take a look at how we can incentivize that one thing that's coming to my mind is maybe we just have a really high eligibility uh, level to get in. Like maybe you have to have a 3.5 GPA or I don't know, we can talk about what would be fair and equitable, but push the students who need to be there without taking a, because the other risk you take is if we're just like, okay, go to Cabrillo and then you fail it, like that F is on your transcript now. You know, oh, you got two career classes, two Fs, and now that's hard to dig out of in terms of applying to college and whatnot. So, okay, good discussion. A quick aside, uh, AP Lit and Comp, what grade level are you going to offer? Grade 11. Okay. Okay. Um, Goal three is parent guardians are engaged as partners through education, communication, and collaboration to ensure students are college and career ready. Um, some of the measure data points we can use to measure our success here include parents clicking on the newsletter that we send out via Parent Square, school site council meetings with quorums, parents attending school site council, families completing the FAFSA, parents participating in PK, which stands for Parent Institute of Quality Education. Uh, parents participating in Triple P and percentage of parents completing volunteer hours. Um, ways that we hope to improve in this area for 24-25. Um, I was really happy with how our school site council went this year. Uh, we had a great uh, participation. We met quorum. Uh, ELAC, DLAC, however, it was very difficult to get people out to attend that. So I'd like to combine the ELAC, DLAC school site council for next school year. I think I heard that that was a possibility from you, Michael. And confirm that that is possible. You had to have a, a vote. A vote yeah. Um, and then uh, continue to host the school site council in Spanish. Uh, a parent shared with me that sometimes parents feel uncomfortable to speak up if it's English translated to Spanish. So now it's Spanish translated to English. And I think that's brought encouraged more participation. Um, we're going to promote an event, uh, Colleges That Change Lives events in San Jose. And we've rented a bus. We're going to take kids there um, at the end of July, on July 29th. Colleges that change live are maybe, I don't know, 50 to 100 colleges across the country that have shown uh, empirically to have great success with students who are um, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, first generation, first generation uh, not white, I, I know, you can go down the list. All the list, all this typical demographics that struggle in school, um, these colleges have proven to be a success. And what they really look like is um, small private schools, but not all. And so it kind of gives that really supportive environment that um, many students need. So they can go here and learn about that, um, which I'm, I'm really excited for um, because sometimes I feel like our view of what's out there kind of just it just ends up being Cabrillo, CSUMB, which are great options. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper, you might find that there's some other opportunities out there that you might not have otherwise thought of. Um, and then finally, develop an in-house parent meeting group for students and their uh, parents encountering challenges at school. And this parent in-house parent meeting group, we would have executive functioning skills, academics, and positive parenting as focuses. Um, when I say in-house, it's because I'll go on the next slide here, but we have two outside organizations, Triple P and PK, who provide parent education to our families. And then I'll go and speak at those. Like there's a principal question night where they ask me a bunch of questions about applying to college and how high school works. Um, but for the 
a lot of the parents that are signing up for that and their families, it's, we're missing the group of students who's struggling with, especially with these three areas. Um, and so we'd like to just bring them in and maybe partner with an organization to deliver these meetings to the families. So that's what we have in, um, in store for 24, 25. Um, any thoughts or questions on this? Well, how would the in-house parent meeting group be different than PK or Triple P? We would create the, or curate and create the content that the parents would receive. And then we would specifically select like, hey, your student's really struggling with X, Y, Z. We need you to have, it's mandatory you come to this meeting every Thursday for however many days. Whereas PK, Triple P, we usually focus in on a particular grade level, send that out, and then they can sign up for it. Um, so it wouldn't be a voluntary sign up. It'd be like, you need to go to this. So it'd be conducted by SABA staff? It'd be conducted by SABA staff. Would that be Mr. Ripp or Ms. Pedley or? Yeah, uh, we have a really strong director of special education who's great at behavior and academic interventions and really can speak well to that. And so I know she'd be involved as well. So um, here, the first couple goals, a lot of the metrics were not available. Um, but um, parents engaged in Parent Square, I just looked at this, we still have 700 some parents engaged in Parent Square, 98, there's only 11 parents who are not reachable via Parent Square right now. Um, so that's worked well in terms of promoting uh, SABA events and updates through that uh, portal. School site council, like I shared, has gone well. It says 721 parents actively engaged. That means, what does that mean exactly? Like if they are, like, so you get a text message saying this is from Parent Square SABA, and then they click, click on, on it and read the PDF about the newsletter for the upcoming week. Or So it's like click on the link that is a- Measures number. whether they're academic or whether they're actively engaged. So that's a one. That's a one. So what that means, with over the course of the year, and how often do these messages go out? Daily. So you could, yeah, I could keep going. In a perfect world, would you expect that there would be 500 clicks a week because all your parents are reading the newsletter? Yes. So what we're saying is over the course of a whole year, we're only getting 721 clicks. No, not at all. So these are parents who are actively engaged. We get between two and 400 clicks per week. I have a table every week um, that our parent engagement coordinator maintains. She's, she puts together the, the, the newsletter and then sends that out. And she's got that number there. So the, what this number is representing is Parent Square has a stat when you go into the Parent Square portal and it says, here's where you're at. And they say 721 parents actively engaged. So it's not just one click, though. They're constantly active, basically. Yeah, I don't know about constantly, but I mean, you're right. I guess it could be one click, and then all of a sudden their counter is actively engaged. I don't, yeah, I'd have to look into that. I can tell you that between 200 and 400 clicks that we've gotten each week for the general newsletters we've sent out. So 400 would be good because you've got 500 students. Um, so that'd be a good rate. So I don't understand where the 721 comes from. Because there's more than like, let's say you're a student, you have a mom and a dad or whoever's your parental guardian. And so it's going to have all of that in the calculation. So if we have 500 students, that would mean there are say a thousand parents. Potentially. And so here we have three quarters of the adults Yes. Clicking. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, assuming that all parents, you know, have it, and in our case, we both have it, and then we end up getting notifications for their grade, like they'll be eleventh grade, and what they're doing for the for the day or for the week. Same thing for sixth grade. In addition to the new letter, those will be like three things. So we send one newsletter out every Monday that is here's the upcoming events, or here's something we can celebrate at SABA. And then that's about a page long. And then we also send seven different letters out saying, 
here's the assignments that are upcoming so you can help your student rather than being retroactive to be like, oh, you're missing assignment in school G that already passed. Um, so school site council, um, talked about that already, but we had a great attendance at that, um, both in terms of we held it in the auditorium and we also have a good audience watching everybody discuss the items that were on the school site council agendas. So 10 parents are 10 parents per meeting. Correct. FAFSA completion among senior families. Uh, I have incomplete data on that. So there was a survey that went out. Um, whenever possible, I try to stay away from survey data just because I feel like it's less um, likely to be true. And so I think there's a way we can check on one of our portals to see truly how many students have completed their FAFSA. So I hope to bring that item back um, on the second meeting in June. Um, that, was, that was a disaster this year with that, right? Yeah, and I do think it's going to be below 90% for a couple of reasons. One, we had six students join the Marines, and I don't know that all six completed the FAFSA. Um, so I know I know at least two said they're not going to do the FAFSA because they're joining the Marines. I don't know about the other four. Um, and then I know a couple from all the FAFSA debacle that ended up happening, they may have, you know, got um had ch challenge f finishing that the um one thing that i think we can look forward to is if we get the california college guidance initiative off the ground and successful supposedly the fafsa will be completed within that portal next year and so hopefully we'll have more success with that all right pk this is what i was talking about earlier this is an outside organization parent institute of quality education they provided three workshops, a social emotional workshop, 55 parents attended that. And that was a series of uh, six classes every Tuesday, for about an hour. There was a bridge to college, which is a series of four classes, 40 parents attended that. And then the, their signature program, which is family engagement, 56 parents attended that. And that was over eight weeks. And then I spoke at the graduation for that. And then parent volunteer hours, um, this, we're lower. So only 16% of our parents have completed 25 plus hours. Another nine are as close to it. 21 are 11 to 20. And then less than 10 is about half of our parents. And so um, that's an area where we need to grow. But that's where we're at for goal three. Any comments or questions about the goal three metrics? Okay. Almost done here. Goal four. Uh, all students will learn in a safe, welcoming, and inclusive learning environment where they're engaged in their own learning in the school community. Here we're looking at suspension rate, expulsion rate, facility inspection tool, healthy kids survey results, percentage of students completing the character strong or social emotional learning curriculum, percentage of teachers awarding five star points, receiving one to one counseling, small group counseling, outside counseling, harassment, um, fighting, and scholastic sports. Um, so, how can we improve in this area? For the upcoming school year, we hope to deepen implementation of restorative presentations by establishing a restorative student council to respond to certain behaviors. So we were at a school in Gilroy, and it was a smaller school, and they have a, I don't know exactly what they call it, but it's basically like a student committee. Let's say there's an infraction. The student has to go in front of that committee, talk about what happened, why they did it, and then the student committee themselves make, makes a decision about what would be the appropriate consequence for the school to try and drive ownership. Um, they shared that it works well. Um, so I think my big takeaway Sorry. That's okay. is I do believe in it. And I think if you go too far too fast, it can just kind of tank school culture. And so we've kind of been incrementally pushing like this year, our big shift was maybe it's for some of the instances that we could suspend a student they do a restorative presentation. That looks like you receive a set of instructions, you create this 15 slide presentation, and then you present it to save a faculty. And that's worked well, and it's been well received, I think, by kind of across the board in terms of this school community. <coughs> um, other ways to make our environment more inclusive, we wanna increase participation in our after school guitar and piano lessons. We have that after school on Mondays and Tuesdays. It's been about five kids for each of the classes. 
And um, while I think the classes like today that are playing guitar sounded really good, we need to get, you know, 10 to 20 kids in those classes. So I'm confident that we can get those numbers up, but that's one way we're going to uh, hopefully improve engagement. Um, the third one is we hired a, a credentialed performing arts teacher who has a lot of experience with that dance instruction. And we hope to offer a dance team after school. Um, and this is going to be part of our extended learning opportunity program where she's going to work as likely an interventionist during the school day. And then she's going to really promote her dance um, opportunities after school. And then finally, we also hired another performing arts teacher who's going to really try to push theater, choir, and possibly band. Um, he has a lot of experience starting and growing programs like this at small schools. And so um, we hope that this can happen at SAVE as well. And that will also be financed through Prop 28, which we're going to talk a little bit about, as well as Standard Learning Opportunity Program. Questions or comments? For the restorative uh, student council idea, would you uh, integrate that into your uh, discipline process? I think like right now, we've been pretty consistent. Like here's your set of instructions, complete your presentation. And then we typically, Ms. Pedley, myself, and our campus supervisor, Mr. Garcia, who will be the um, audience for the presentation. And even like when there's been physical altercations, we've had the two, two students who fought um, present together. So I think the next step would be instead of presenting to us, present in front of the student restorative council. But um, I want to look into it a little bit more. That's how it worked at this school in Gilroy we visited, but I want to make sure that that's in keeping with what the best practices are. But I feel like we're at a point where we could do this at least for some instances of discipline and be successful with it. We would have some prerequisites for this student council, right? Like they're not just going to go grab any of the students. They don't have to have a current GPA, good standing. Yeah. So that they can make good judgment decisions. Mm -hmm. And trying, I mean, the whole idea is to try and drive student ownership over the culture of our school. Like it's not, you know, my school or Ms. Bedley's school, it's all of our school. And so we all want everybody to behave appropriately. And when somebody doesn't, it creates a ripple for everybody. So, uh, okay, so some metrics here. Uh, we only had 25 students suspended this year, um, which is still a little bit over the state average, but we're down to 4.9%, which I'm really proud of. We were at 9.4 three years ago. So we've gone down significantly over the last three years. Um, and large part, thanks to the restorative presentations, was the big shift this year. Um, facility inspection tool, we scored ourselves exemplary on that, um, meaning that the facility is in good repair. Um, number of teachers awarding five-star points. Only five teachers are consistently awarding five-star points. Five-star points is like in a token economy where if you exhibit good behavior, you can receive rewards. Edgar, I'm curious, in your experience day-to-day, -day, do you encounter people giving five-star points? Yeah. Maybe Alfred does, but at least for the most part, you don't hear much about it. Yeah. Okay. So that's an area where we need to improve. Um, the five star store is popular. There's a line at that store every day after school. Um, so I know the middle, primarily middle school students. So there, there's buy in from at least the middle school students, but I think we can do better um, in that area. Um, number of students receiving counseling. So we had two counseling therapy interns um, through Encompass, and we had 62 students total receive counseling this year. Um, number of students receiving outside referrals, um, still trying to find out the total number, but I believe it was 12 um, that got outside counseling, and then interscholastic sports participation. We had 110 students go out for middle school sports, 63 girls and 47 boys. Some highlights there, there's only about 240 middle school students, period. So that's almost 40% of our middle school went out for a sport, which I think is amazing. And I'm also impressed that more girls than boys went out for sports. Um, and then in high school, 
63 boys or 63 participants, 34 boys, 29 girls. So that's been pretty static. We've always had low 60s in terms of number of high school students participating in sports. And uh, that ends the LCAP presentation. Any comments or questions? Just a curiosity question on the, the star, what is it, five star mm -hmm. point? How, how do the teachers just sign in? I don't, I'm not saying so much like, how do they come up? Oh, I'm going to give that kid the five, you know, stars or whatever. <clears throat> but more like, do they go up to the kid and then they kind of give them a little card or do they just enter it on their computer? They enter it in their computer. And I actually think this is an obstacle. Like one of the two of the teachers, they're not even teachers, they were support aides for the online teachers that we had. They gave out a lot, but it was partly because they're well trained in using a, like a barcode scanner. And so they could just scan the tops of the kids uh, Chromebooks and they're then scan the barcode it automatically deposits five star points. And we wanted to get that middle school wide, but we never quite got there. Or if we did and it just didn't take off, that might be it too. Cause I, we went over multiple times, like, Hey, let's make sure every teacher's trained up on this. But when I looked at the stats, it did not indicate that everybody was using it that way. So it does show, I mean, yeah, cause my question was more like, or my curiosity was, is it, is it showing the other kids in the class like, oh, I should also, you know, do better, improve better because oh, they got it. So I want to, you know, yeah, work on it harder. So I also get something. It has every iteration. You can go individual student, you can do group student, you can do the whole class, and then you can also toggle the amount of points that the students earn for the particular behavior. Yeah. All right. No further questions on the uh, LCAP report. We move on to consent agenda. Um, I had a couple questions about the uh, warrant report. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions on any of the items of the consent agenda? So I have a motion then to approve B, C, and D on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passed unanimously. Third motion. Uh, Larry and uh, Dr. Portillo. So looking at A and looking at the summary, I just wanted to ask some questions about uh, some of the higher end, the, the larger amounts here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a seldom sun for $27,000. What was that for? Let me find it. Oh, that, so there was a, our partitions, the bathroom stalls in the boys' bathroom had been in disrepair for pretty much since last year and the doors when it shut. So we talked about this at that meeting and that was the installation of the new All right. partitions. All right. Yep. Uh, and uh, Apple computer, was that just buying uh, new replacement uh, technology? Uh, give me one second. $6,000. Uh, replacement laptops, yep. What about Central Coast shipping and screen for $25,000? The uniforms, I believe. Give me one second. Oh. Right. Yeah, so we bulk order uniforms, get them here by June, and then have them for sale over the summer. And then we've kind of gone through a lot of different iterations with this, but we landed. The most successful is just to have everything here, sell through 80% of the inventory, prior to the start of school and then have that whatever's left as parents kind of come by throughout the school year. All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, A on the consent agenda regarding the uh, warrant? Gershom, is there a second? Second. Larry? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Right. Moving on to our action item, Prop 28 annual report. 
Okay, so um, Prop 28 is a art and music grant that public schools are receiving to encourage art and music in schools. And uh, SABA uh, started um, using those funds this year um, with uh, a piano and guitar teacher named Bruce Gasilnan. And he has offered classes after school on Mondays and Tuesdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. And so we've paid his, uh, he's not a credential teacher, just a piano and guitar teacher. Um, we've paid his hourly rate as well as uh, music instruments. So we bought a number of pianos and guitars that students could uh, use for the class. And so um, essentially how we ended up doing it once we saw the total number of interested parties is students can pick up a keyboard, take that home and keep it at home. And then we have enough keyboards here that we can pull them out and put them on the desk and they practice on the keyboards here. And then we store them in the closet. And then the students are expected to practice on their keyboards that they have at home that is leased from SABA to them. And then it's the same process with the guitars. So um, all schools that use Prop 28 funds need to have this approved by the board. Um, so I'm asking SABA's board of directors to approve our Prop 28 funding for the fiscal year 23-24. Question I have. Well, does anybody else have a question? Um, so in the LCAP in goal four, you talk about increased participation in that school guitar and piano lessons. And then after school dance instruction. Mm -hmm. And then theater, choir, and possibly band. Are all those you're thinking about funding through this Prop 28? Great question. Um, no, some of those programs may be funded through Prop 28. Um, the other funding source that I envision funding the performing arts and dance teacher is through the Extended Learning Opportunity Program. To have funds used for that, uh, which we didn't end up using this year um, is uh, you need to have a school day that runs um, 10 hours, 8.30 or nine hours, 8.30 to 5.30. So we have to have program offerings until 5.30. We have to give parental notification and parents have to accept that they are interested or not interested in pursuing that. Um, and then we need to make clear what the programs are that the students can pursue using this funding. And so um, the performing arts and uh, dance teacher will assuredly be using these. Uh, a lot of the sports will be using some of that funding. And then we're also gonna have, like for example, in an intercession, a typical state intercession, we have students here for credit recovery outside of, so it's extending learning, but they're not, they're only here from about E3 to three. So we're also gonna have over the summer sports conditioning with uh, Coach Gonzalez, who's our PE teacher. And that'll go till 5.30. And then that way we can use some of the funding for that. So to answer your question, yes, for the performing arts and dance teacher, I do envision using some of the Prop 20 funds for that. And some of them I will use Yellow Peak. Right. Any other questions regarding Prop 28? I have a motion to approve Prop 28. So moved. Thank you, Roberto. Thirteen okay. seconds. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Crickets? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. All righty. That, ladies and gentlemen, any items that people would like to see on the next agenda? Huh? <laughs> Now time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you think you'll have anything, <laughs> any uh, progress towards uh, fleshing out what we were talking about regarding the uh, dual enrollment issues by then, or should we look at that down the road a little bit more? You know, it's a good question because, in fairness to Edgar, if we are going to do this for the upcoming school year, we need to take, there's a, I'm, June, June 18th meeting is going to be long. I'm just going to tell you right now. We have staff handbook, student handbook, 
maybe this policy, LCAP approval. There's a bunch of things. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, it, we have to, because if we took action after the start of the school year, you know, it'd be kind of weird to go into school year without having that policy in force. So what if we start gathering some information? I'll, I'll get a hold of the, the rules around dual enrollment for Fremont Union High School District. Bert will get it for Santa Clara. We'll see what other schools are doing with it, and then you can kind of create your own. Okay. So I'll bring those to the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, I agree. If I might say, um, uh, I do think that the ideas of students taking the college classes is kind of conflicting that way, and mostly the idea that um, some students would just want to get out of Sable and just take a bunch of degrees. So I think maybe if that is a problem, you could at least pioneer the using dual enrollment credits to make the club the easiest and secure requirement and maybe the super best way the college comes to it. And if that seems to do well with the students, you can expand on that. And in addition, I was talking to a student once that said that in their school, I'm not sure if they're working here, but mm -hmm. uh, in their school, it's just high school. And in ninth and tenth grade, it's classes in the campus, right? Yeah. Um, and it can be, I think, AP honors or such. And then through 11 to 12, they can go or they're told to take college classes and they're told to at least have a minimum of four career classes or college classes. And that way, it's because it's two years, they'll graduate high school with an associate's degree. Yeah. I visited a school that did exactly that. Um, yeah, and it's really impressive. And I came back like, wow, we need to do this. And I think um, we just need to think about how we can support all of our students here while offering that opportunity to the students who deserve that opportunity. So um, I think if nothing else, we can bring something to the board that we start off small in terms of maybe who can qualify for it and see how that goes and we can grow it from there. Do you think it, the other thing I'd be willing to do would, to see, would be to see if uh, Ariana or Isabel would be interested in sharing their experience with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be great. Uh, sounds like we have a big agenda on the 18th, so. Well, I mean, if they can come. Okay. I mean, you just met, you just brought up another issue with that. Like one time we had a bunch of students sign up for a math class and I got calls from the Cabrillo administrator as well as the teacher saying he was so frustrated with the student's behavior in that class because they brought their high school antics to the college classroom. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not, again, not trying to say no. I'm just saying these are all of the reasons why it can be a challenge. So. Does Cabrillo have the option to say, you know, you're not demonstrating that you're, you have the maturity to be a college student. I don't know. See you later, alligator. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think they tried not to do that, but yeah. Hey, just one last thing. So it gets in the minutes. He did a really nice job with the note cap. It okay. was very clear. It was very easy to follow. The goals were commendable. One of your great strengths. You did a good job. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Thank Appreciate you. That. Okay. All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Please. Steve Gershom, second. Second. Thank you, Roberto. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Again, passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, marathon on the 18th.